So my name is Mary Dickinson. I am the Regional Sustainable Design Leader at Perkins & Will. That is a uh, global architecture and design firm, so very different maybe from some of the other moderators that you've had up, and hopefully we'll have a pretty interactive discussion today based on that. Um, a little bit about my background. I work a lot in sustainability, but I have my degree in interior design, and that was, and that correlated to sustainability because I started to think about what could my impacts be on occupants, on their health, in the way that I design, in the way that I think about the environment. And the more and more I got into sustainability, we heard a little bit of from Mahesh earlier, we really start to think about materials and the material makeup, right? So the other hat that I wear within the firm is that I'm co-director of the Material Performance Lab. And um, my lab basically wants to look at what are the impacts of what we do on the health of occupants and on the health of the environment. Um, I manage the firm's precautionary list, which is a list of substances that we find in building materials that have known or suspected human and environmental health impacts. Um, and the way that we go about that right now is on the, the hazard approach. If there is a known or suspected hazard that has been provided by the scientific community, yourselves, or a governmental body, um, we, look at that, we look at those and we see how often those show up in building materials. We worked with Gina's group, the Healthy Building Network, to assess how many times that these substances show up in building materials and then made um, a decision as to what needed to show up on that list and go after the heavy hitters that really appeared over and over and over again. Um, so that list is really important to us and your work is extremely important to us because it lets us know in the design community how we can make change, impact change, um, to make these healthier spaces. Um, in addition to that, we're looking to, this community is looking at indoor studies. What is the pre and post occupancy impact of those decisions? And we want to see what other substances are showing up that we're not thinking about. Um, there's been a little bit shared already about all of these chemicals and the compounds that are created on a daily basis and what do we or do we not know. And so that's really important to us in these studies to try to find out. Um, so I'm really excited about today's panel and how this correlates into what these fine doctors have been studying. Um, we're looking at indoor chemistry problems and solutions. And I think um, we'll have a lot to talk about. So I want to introduce each of our speakers and then have them come up and then we're gonna change it up a little bit. We're gonna have a transition question in between to kind of get some thoughts going. Um, so first off, we have Dr. Manabu Shireiwa, am I good? <laughs> He was an associate professor of chemistry at the University of California, Irvine. Um, Dr. Shira Iwa serves as the principal investigator of the Modeling Consortium for Chemistry of Indoor Environments. The, um, the project that he's been working on has a goal to develop comprehensive integrated physical chemical models that include a detailed representation of the chemistry in the indoor environment whether on the surface of materials, as particles, as a gas, and then to simulate how occupants, their indoor activities, and um, buildings influence those chemical processes. Um, what I really liked that he shared with me earlier when we were talking, he said, I never thought I was going to be talking to an architect, an engineer, or a designer, much less. And this is really exciting to him. So I'm, I'm happy for that. Um, so Dr. Shariwa, if you'd like to come up. Take us away. Okay. Thank you for a nice uh, introduction, and thanks uh, to AAAS, uh, Annette, and Paula for uh, organizing this great symposium and having me uh, here. And I'm going to uh, introduce you about our uh, modeling projects. So I'm a chemist and a modeler, so I'm going to talk about our activities uh, on indoor chemistry. So the Modeling Consortium for Chemistry of Indoor Environments as uh, funded by Swan Foundation. So we are trying to model indoor chemical processes, including surface interactions, pollutant dynamics, and chemistry happening in the gas phase, and also the formation of secondary organic aerosols. <laughs> 
And we are the team of eight investigators from seven different institutions and three postdocs and seven students. And uh, the unique thing of this consortium is we cover the wide range of uh, time scale and length scale. So we have Professor Doug Tobias from UCI who does molecular dynamic simulation, who is dealing with less than one nanoseconds and uh, molecules. And myself, uh, working on kinetic process model with Glenn Morrison on kinetic processes happening on skin, clothing, and indoor surfaces. We have co-PI, Nick Castro from, from University of York, who does gas-based chemistry modeling, and Michael Waring from Drexel University on modeling secondary organic aerosol formation in indoor environments, and uh, Don Hyun Lim, who works on computational fluid dynamics, who is dealing with scale of days and room scale, basically. We have two new investigators recently, John Little from Virginia Tech and Andy Zuent, who does some dynamic model, modeling. So the aim of this consortium is really to work together and connect different scales of models. And you will, of course, question, how come you connect molecular dynamic simulation with CFD but we actually made it happen. These two people have now co our papers. And I want to show today that how we really bridge the scale. The, the strategy we have is, is, of course, difficult to directly connect MD simulations with CFD, but he can climb up using me as a step stone, right? <laughs> climb up. I'm going to show how we do that, how we did it. OK, so what are our objectives? So the objective is to develop, at least this is our ambition, to develop comprehensive integrated indoor chemistry models, it's chemistry models, okay, that include a realistic representation of gas, aerosols, and surface chemistry. So that's the big objectives we have. And then another big point is we want to integrate with experiments and measurements. So we want to assess gap in our fundamental understanding of indoor chemistry. And we have a focus points of two points. One is uh, the, the law of occupants and also the impact of indoor activities. And we focus on the cleaning. To do that, why we want to do that is we want to generalize observations. Because often experiments or measurements are conducted at certain conditions or even high concentration. And to generalize that, maybe you, want, you can use a model to achieve really predictive capability. So that the point is also we want to make predictions, right? So that's our goal and ambition to make it, uh, to, to have a model, integrate with experiments, measurements, and to gain the predictive cap capability. So why MOKI, why we exist, and why experimentalists or measurement people uh, think about collaborating with us? I have two important points for you. So the first point is by working with us, you could gain mechanistic and quantitative interpretation, namely testing hypothesis. So you do experiments, you have measurements, you have some observations, you may have some hypothesis, you want to test it, and we can help doing that. And I will show you with these two studies how we, how we do that in, in this talk. The second, to second point is you can extrapolate to different indoor conditions and also even inaccessible properties by measurements. Okay, so often experiments, particularly lab experiments, are conducted often at high concentrations so that you can see the signal. But in real indoor environments, maybe concentrations are low, reaction times can be longer. Using the model, you can extrapolate to different conditions. And also, another point is inaccessible properties. For example, you may, you may measure average ozone concentration in the room, but you may not know how ozone is distributed in the room. And using CFD, you can, you can address such, uh, such questions. OK, with this point, I'd like to show uh, the first uh, study, which is looking into the ozone reactions with humans. So in this morning, uh, Jonathan Williams uh, gave a wonderful talk on that. And we are modeling such processes. Okay, we look into the reaction of ozone with clothing and skin, and Doug Tobias can do a molecular dynamic simulations. Now this red dot is ozone molecule flying into the skin oil. He can calculate Henry's low constant, bulk diffusion coefficient, how ozone interacts with your skin. Using that information, here's my postdoc, Pascal Reiki, constructed a kinetic model which can treat how ozone interacts with clothing. It may diffuse through clothing. Leach skin, it reacts with squalene, which is a skin oil component, and then generates such SVOCs, 
into the glass phase. So we have a kinetic model to simulate such processes with a multi-layer uh, uh, method we developed. And using that kinetic model information, we feed that information to computational fluid dynamics run by Don Hyun Lim. So with that, MD and CFD is direct, indirectly connected through kinetic model. So by achieving such models and model framework, we can simulate experiments. This is experiments, the benchmark experiments conducted by Charlie Wesher and Ami Wisthara, published in PNSS 2010, that uh, in time, uh, time zero, two people enter the room, and ozone concentration goes down. This is the measurements, markers are measurements, and we can model that using our model, reproduce it, and at the same time, these SPOCs are generated by humans. So this is 6-MHO and 4-OPA is generated. And we can use our model to explain this data. So the model is these lines. And, and, and we can uh, reproduce these measurements. And the point is some of these, some of these compounds, particularly carbonyl compounds, are known as respiratory or, or skin irritants. So now we have MD simulations feeding into kinetic model that is constrained to the measurements then put into connect with computational fluid dynamics. This figure shows the spatial distribution of semi-volatiles. This one is 6-MHO primary product of reaction. 4-OPA is a secondary product. And with such uh, exercise and modeling studies, we show that soil closing protects skin from ozone exposure, but it can enhance exposure to oxidation products. And you can see about 1.6 to 2 times higher concentrations in the breathing zone than in room air. Okay, so put this in the context of real life uh, following this plenary speaker. That um, so we sometimes are very busy, too busy to laundry, right? But better you better do laundry, right? And and some people are even proud of wearing same clothing every day, like scientists or students. But you may really want to wash your clothes because the soil clothing you would pollute yourself. Okay, not only pollute yourself, but also pollute your caric. So that's one of the so insight you can get from her modeling that, okay, let's, let's, let's do laundry. We are busy, but we should still do that. Okay. All right, so the, I want to, to move on to the next study in collaboration with uh, Vicky Grass, and she's sitting here from UC San Diego. So, so there's SVOCs and VOCs in indoor environments. We had great talk with Alan Goldstein. And we want to understand how that interact with indoor surfaces. And Vicky Gracian's group conduct, conducted experiments how it, how it absorbed on the grass surfaces, SiO2. So she, she did measurements. And then now, again, mo molecular dynamic simulations by Dr. Tobias. He can tell how exactly molecule in the, it would interact with surfaces. And that information can be fed into our kinetic model to explain the absorption and desorption kinetics. So again, the, the state of the art experiments, molecular dynamic simulations, kinetic model, we can explain and then get some critical information such as absorption enthalpy of the limony absorption onto SiO2. For the next study, we looked into the reaction of ozone with polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon in oil films. So this is in collaboration with uh, uh, John Abbott from University of Toronto. So um, the, the motivation of this study is that if you do cooking, such as um, stir fry, particularly using oils, namely Chinese cooking, you use lots of oils, and incomplete combustion would maybe probably lead to the formation of um, um, oil films in kitchen, particularly, that would mix um, a mixed film, which is polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which is actually carcinogen and toxic, embedded into cooking oil. And they heated experiments exposing this um, film to ozone, and they measure how fast this PAH would decay away. Okay, and then um, um, this is this is his experimental data. I don't want to go into too much in chemistry, but uh, what we found is actually during this course of reaction, phase separation and slow diffusion really prolong the lifetime of PAH in indoor indoor air indoor surface films, and we extrapolate to different indoor conditions, namely uh, a lower ozone concentration, and really show that the effect of um, this detailed physical chemical processes, namely phase separation and bulk diffusion, can impact the, the lifetime of PAH in indoor surfaces. Okay, 
Then at last, I want to show that uh, uh, so, uh, Nina Barnes gave a fantastic talk this morning about HomeCam. So we are also modeling that uh, process. And I, I show one uh, um, uh, example here, particularly interacting with Delphin Pharma and HomeCam team, that they did breach screening, and then they found ammonia concentration drops, and then these kind of chlorinated compounds is formed and decayed away. Okay, and then to simulate such breach screening uh, processes, we constructed a model that considers gas phase reactions, surface reactions on the surface, particle uptake, photolysis reaction, and so on. And also chemistry in breach layer. So with this uh, um, chemistry, chemical reactions, which is happening on the indoor surfaces, we can reproduce this, the, their measurements. So by, by doing that, so, so this was uh, Delphine Pharma has a hypothesis, probably multiphase chemistry is playing a role, and we tested that hypothesis by implementing that model, uh, 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 by implementing that reactions into our model. So with that, I want to uh, leave you with three take home messages. So first message is Moki, we Moki team, modeling team collaborates to combine models, particularly with different scales of models, and aiming to develop uh, integrated indoor chemistry models. Moki integrates with experiments, measurements, to gain fundamental understanding of indoor chemistry. And Moki predicts, at least this is our ambition, we are maybe not fully really there yet, but we want to quantify and predict impacts of indoor activities and chemistry at humans and surfaces. And then really to, to the, the, our ambition and the big goal is to help achieving healthy indoor environments. With that, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so the question that I have for you, since we're kind of talking about this interdisciplinary work, right. right, and thought processes, based on what you've been working on in the modeling, how do you foresee your, mo or your modeling software changing how designers um, or engineers can change how they might design the mechanical systems or change the mechanical systems based on what you've learned so, so far? Yes. So that's, that's a very important question, and I don't have a single answer because maybe answer could be different depending on the, on the different conditions. But in terms of uh, um, human exposure, particularly to SVOCs, probably that um, higher exchange rate would be desired, but this depends on the condition because if outdoor is really polluted, you don't want to bring polluted outdoor to indoor, right? And uh, so that's trade-off, but um, um, yeah. We need to work together. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be great. That's great. All right. So, Dr. Corey Young is the Guy Warwick Rogers Chair in Chemistry and Assistant Professor at York University in Toronto, Canada. Her research focuses on the development and application of new analytical uh, techniques to increase our understanding of issues regarding indoor and outdoor air quality climate change, and long-distant pollutant transports. So, Dr. Corey, please take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. So I'll be talking about a range of topics today, um, giving an overview of a few different studies that relate to three different fields that really intersect with indoor chemistry. So that's contaminant transport, cooking practices, and materials chemistry. So I'm going to start out with transport of persistent contaminants, and this is really where um, I started my career. I, be, I did my PhD in this topic. Um, and many persistent contaminants um, are derived from consumer products, and thus we emit them during their use and or their disposal. So a lot of the, the emissions end up happening indoors. So what I've shown here on the bottom left are some um, of the chemicals we expect to be emitted indoors from consumer products, some of which you've heard about already today. So we have some flame retardants and uh, perfluorinated substances. So most of these persistent contaminants are also found in remote areas. So they're found far from where anyone is actually using these contaminants, which means that they're being transported there somehow. So they're leaving our indoor environment, getting into the outdoor regions um, 
around where we live, and because they're persistent, they can actually end up tr being transported long distances. And the way that this happens is uh, varies from chemical to chemical um, and is not really that well understood. So I'm going to talk about uh, a couple chemicals today. The first is uh, PFAS, the perfluoroalkyl substances uh, that everybody is now uh, really excited about. And these are used in many commercial products, uh, particularly non-stick applications. Um, and uh, one application that they've been used in for a long time is carpets. And what happens is when we use these carpets, um, a small fraction of the chemicals used to make these polymers can actually be released into the indoor environment. Um, and these are volatile um, uh, PFAS compounds. They're not the acids that we are often uh, hearing about in the news. Um, and what we have been doing in my group um, is looking at their concentrations in ice cores. Uh, so we have two ice cores that we collected from uh, the high Canadian Arctic. And um, in those ice cores, we've looked for the persistent PFAS compounds, so the acids that you uh, probably heard about in the news. Um, and what we're really interested in is how do these indoor emissions of the volatile compounds relate to these persistent compounds? Um, and we know they can be transformed chemically. Um, from the volatile compounds to the persistent ones. So from our ice cores, we end up with this multi-decadal record that allows us to use environmental forensics to really determine the sources and transport pathways. Um, so I'm just going to give you a, a, a taste of one of those um, forensic sort of environmental forensic techniques that we, that we use. Um, so one of the, these volatile compounds we know from chamber experiments can degrade into the persistent compounds, and we know the expected ratios of different um, homologs that we would expect. So for example, this volatile compound forms two of the persistent acids in about a one-to-one -one yield, and then we have a, um, another volatile compound, and it again forms two different homologs, again at about a one-to-one -one yield, and a longer chain one, similar story. So what these forensic techniques, this one and others, tell us is that these, these persistent acid homologs um, provide kind of a, a link between the volatile compounds that we are emitting in our homes and the high levels uh, or the levels that we're seeing in, in ice caps. Okay, so I'm going to move on now to talk about um, a little bit about flame retardants. Um, so these are the polybrominated diphenyl ethers that Heather mentioned earlier. Um, most of which have been phased out, but still exist in our consumer products uh, that are legacy in our homes. Um, and these are also found in remote regions. They're found in ice caps. Um, and the distribution of the congeners of these different uh, PBDEs suggests that transport on aerosols could be important for these compounds. And so uh, one of my graduate students made some uh, measurements of size-resolved aerosol composition of these PBDEs um, in homes. And what she saw was that uh, these PBDEs were present in the really tiny aerosols, ones that could have a really long lifetime outdoors and could potentially be contributing to um, the, the, uh, the loadings of these compounds in the remote regions. So again, we're seeing a potential link between PBDEs in our aerosols indoors and what we uh, see in remote regions. Okay, so on to the next uh, sub-discipline, uh, which is looking at cooking. Um, and as we know, and we've heard a little bit about this today, that cooking is a major chemical emission source indoors. And the type of stove uh, used for cooking really drives um, the type and extent of emissions. So this, can, uh, this depends on what's available to people in their homes. So it, we know that in low and middle income countries, stove use can be determined by access as well as by cultural preferences. So biomass burning is a traditional cooking technique, uh, but there's efforts to transition people to use cleaner stoves. But there's cultural barriers to this, as well as uh, barriers of access. In higher income countries, um, well, at least in the US, um, ac access and cultural preferences can also play a role. Um, so we're seeing an increased preference for the use of gas stoves in the US in recent years. So the first study I'm going to talk about here relates to stove use in India. Um, and this is, uh, uh, we looked at different types of improved cook stoves being used in one of the poorest um, provinces of India. Um, and this is a, a really big collaborative study led out of Duke University. And the idea was to assess the impact on household pollution as well as illnesses. And this study collected particles um, and measured the sum total of PM2.5, the particulate matter, uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PHs, those were measured, measured by Heather's group, and total water-soluble organic nitrogen, uh, which my group measured. 
And we saw that um, there was a dramatic difference uh, between the traditional stove and uh, the improved stove for all three of these um, metrics of household air pollution. And furthermore, um, there was a positive association between hospitalization and the levels of these three measures of pollution. So uh, we're seeing a really important um, uh, effect of the use of different stoves on, um, on human health in India. And this is a, an issue in the U.S. as well um, with uh, the use of gas stoves. So we heard earlier that NOx, so NO and NO2, are, are really well known to be emitted from gas ranges. And this is a huge consideration for human exposure, uh, particularly with respect to NO2. And I really became interested in this um, because I have uh, some experience measuring uh, these compounds outdoors. Um, and I know that measuring NO2, sometimes we have to think about uh, influences of HONO and vice versa. So HONO um, is something that um, is tricky to measure. Um, and when uh, we did some measurements in a Syracuse, New York home, we saw that a large fraction of the NO2 uh, was actually nitrous acid or HONO. Um, and we just heard um, earlier today about how HONO um, is involved in the production of uh, toxic nitrosamines, and it's also um, a potential health concern on its own. Um, so what we were seeing was that the NO2 measurement, um, it's a standard NO2 measurement, and it works really well outdoors to measure NO2 when we don't, we have very, very low levels of HONO, but when we bring this indoors and HONO levels are quite high, we can actually see a substantial interference. So it turns out that, um, at least in this um, environment, the levels of NO2 and HONO were quite comparable, which was pretty shocking uh, to me. So these, are, these levels are orders of magnitude higher than outdoors for HONO. And the last thing I'm going to talk about um, is looking at materials for air purification. Um, so as we were just talking about cooking, um, production of some chemicals indoors is essentially unavoidable if we're going to undergo, uh, if we're going to do our normal activities. Um, so it can be worthwhile to develop te materials that can remove uh, these chemicals from our environment. So there are typically two types of approaches to these types of, uh, develop types of materials. We can either try to sequester um, the chemicals or we can try and decontaminate them. So a common example that many people are familiar with because this has been um, in the news is uh, the use of titanium dioxide containing materials to decontaminate um, air pollution. Um, so some examples of this are self-cleaning windows and photocatalytic paints. And uh, there are materials containing titan titanium dioxide that are actually marketed to remove NO2 um, from the environment. Uh, but what turns out can happen is that NO2 is removed, yes, but what is being produced is NO and HONO. So we haven't really decontaminated, we've just changed the contamination. Um, and so, you know, NO and HONO are also problematic in their own right, but then through gas phase reactions, we can reconvert NO and HONO back to NO2. So this is, um, we need to make sure we consider the full range of, of uh, products that might be formed um, on these materials. Okay, so I've been working with um, a materials chemist, uh, Mike Katz, and we've been looking at metal organic frameworks, um, which are porous materials that have very high surface area. Uh, I'm told that one gram of material has the same surface area as a football field. Um, and so they're very useful for chemical sorption. Um, so we've been looking at um, a MOF and trying to uh, sorptively remove HONO. So I mentioned I was interested in HONO, so that, that continues here as well. Um, and so these MOFs um, are a combination of these uh, metal nodes as well as uh, organic linkers. And um, we combine them together to form this framework. And what we saw was that the tested MOF reversibly sorbed HONO with really good efficiency, so that's great. We can, we can sequester HONO in, in, this, uh, in this material. But what we really wanted to see is if we could decontaminate it. Um, so we can tune these MOFs chemically, um, and we can try and exploit uh, chemical reactions to actually decontaminate. Uh, so we uh, chemically tuned one of the linkers. Uh, we added uh, an H2 group. And um, by doing that, we actually irreversibly removed um, HONO using this MOF. And we did a series of experiments to make sure that what we were producing after we removed HONO was not something um, that could be problematic. 
Um, and through some experiments, we saw that we were actually producing um, nitrogen gas and water, um, which means that we're completely denoxifying Hono and mineralizing it to form uh, nitrogen and water. So the targeted design of materials um, for important chemicals indoors is a promising uh, research direction. Okay, so just some conclusions here. Um, in the first small section of my talk, uh, I showed you that there's a linkage between contaminants that we find in remote areas and those that we find um, at high levels indoors through use of consumer products. Uh, we see that chemicals found indoors can depend strongly on stove choice, and this uh, is in both high, low and high income areas. And we saw that materials can be chemically tuned to target and mineralize indoor chemical species of interest. And I'd like to uh, finish by saying that working across disciplinary boundaries really leverages expertise for deeper understanding in both disciplines. So this benefits our indoor chemistry as well as the other disciplines that uh, we're working with. And lastly, I'd like to acknowledge my additional collaborators, uh, group members, funding agencies, and thank you for your attention. We're going with the flow right now. Yep. That's right. <laughs> Okay, so I, um, my question is, for those materials um, that are being chemically tuned to target and mineralize um, indoor chemical or indoor chemical species of interest, right? How can we better understand how long these chemical reactions will continue to occur? So how would I, as a designer, have an understanding of how long can I depend on that to bring in these, some of these substances I want to remove from that indoor environment? Right, that's a great question. So. Um, that really requires us to know a lot about what the typical levels are <laughs> indoors. So for something like Hono, we can, we've kind of ballparked what we think, um, how long we think it would last. Um, and our ballpark is it would take about, in a, in a home, typical home with a gas stove, about five grams would last for a month. So, okay. but if you don't have a gas stove or you have <laughs> something different than the typical home that we've, um, we've assessed or you know, made up, um, then it could, be, uh, it could be a lot different than that. So I would say uh, really understanding levels is going to be crucial. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Well, our next speaker, Dr. Glenn Morrison, is a professor of environmental science and engineering at the university, I should say the, right? the University of North Carolina. <laughs> His research is primarily focused on indoor atmospheric physics and chemistry. He has a particular expertise in the interfacial surface chemistry and will share how the contents of a building can continuously participate in chemistry that increase human exposures to pollutants or can be harnessed to the benefit of the occupants. Can't wait to hear. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Hi. <clears throat> so uh, what I'm going to talk about is actually very related to what Cora was talking about at the very end there, and it's a good segue. Um, and actually I'm going to talk about the, this in a somewhat broader terms. Um, in fact, thermo thermodynamic terms, but don't worry. So when we are exposed to pollutants, we accumulate pollutants from our environment in, um, if we are in contact with an environment, either directly or, or indirectly, that has that pollutant, and the chemical activity of that pollutant is higher in that environment than in us. This is a driving force. Okay? This isn't true in every single case, but it's mostly true. So you can think of this uh, a bit like temperature. So when you have a hot object and a cold object and they're in the same environment, um, heat will flow from the hot object to the cold object as long as they're somehow in contact with one another. Um, and that's what this chemical activity idea really is like. Now I really like to think of it in terms of reservoirs. So if we think of, let's say this couch here is a reservoir of flame retardants as um, Heather showed. And she's, she's nodding her head saying, that's not big enough, right? <laughs> it's gotta be a bigger reservoir. Um, and, but the air is a much smaller reservoir for that same uh, pollutant. There's some in it, but it's a smaller box in a sense. And we are somewhere in between. We're, we, could, we could take on some pollutants. Now, these are reservoirs, but there's this idea that, the, you can see it right here, that there's a flow from one side to another. And so it, 
it's chemical activity actually in our case that's driving this exposure. And if we think of the height of these reservoirs as the chemical activity, this concept of chemical activity, um, where the chemical activity is quite high in this first reservoir, in this couch, and it's somewhat lower in us because we're taking it in and perhaps metabolizing these chemicals, um, then in general what you have is a net chemical uptake towards us. Now, how might you deal with this? Well, obviously the first thing you would do is try to get rid of the couch if you knew that this was a problem. But as you've seen um, in several talks, some of these, these pollutants that are in our environments are legacy chemicals. They're there, they're, they've, they've got there 30 years ago and they're still there. And we can't necessarily clean up every house. We can build a new building that is as clean as we can make it, but there's gonna be buildings out there for many decades that are contaminated. So how do we deal with this? Well, um, what we could do if we can't get rid of the source directly is we can drive down at least the activity in the environments that we're closest in contact with, like the air in this case. So one way to do that would be add some additional sink, something that draws down this activity which would lower our uptake rate of these chemicals. And so that's actually what Cora was talking about. Basically, let's find a way to get rid of the Hono by putting a sink in there, something that drives the Hono down. So surfaces indoors, as we've heard several times, Rich talked about it early on, Cora talked about it, are really, really useful. And one of the reasons they're useful is that there's so much surface area available. So um, they've talked about 300 times outdoor. Well, I like to think of it this way. What you see around us, that, that sort of available surface area, that projected surface area, is about two to three square meters per cubic meter. When air pollutants can interact with it, they can only get to it so fast, and that's something we call mass transfer coefficient, which is somewhere around one to five uh, meters per hour. When you combine those together, you get a number that's actually equivalent to a clean air, air exchange rate if you're removing all the molecules as fast as you can. So if these services were cleaning the air by just absorbing chemicals, that's equivalent of having a very, very high air, uh, clean air rate coming into a building. So let's do a thought experiment here. Let's say, uh, oh, actually, I'll do the thought experiment in a moment. I want to talk about one more thing first. So. Um, You've heard the term semi-volatile organic compound a lot today. Alan Goldstein, I think, may have been the first to introduce it. I'm not sure. But anyway, it's, it's, a, uh, it's basically a kind of a sticky compound, the lower volatility sticky compound. Back in um, the, around 2000, 2000, 2001, Mike Van Loy at uh, Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory and colleagues um, were injecting nicotine into a large room-sized chamber um, to look at how it would absorb the carpet, adsorb the carpet. And what they observed is that when you inject nicotine, it goes up really high in the, in the room, and it would stay high if there was nothing for it to absorb to. But because there was carpet there, the concentration dropped very rapidly because the carpet was such a big reservoir. In fact, that's what you would expect with any semi-volatile organic compound, because it turns out textiles have a huge capacity to absorb organic compounds. And <clears throat> there's a lot of data that's come out in the past uh, 20 years, um, on this, and we've studied it in many different ways, and so these textiles can actually do, do a good job as long as they are at a lower chemical activity than the environment they're in for that chemical of interest. So now we'll do a thought experiment. So let's say we use this idea of clean textiles. So once every 20 years or so, um, you replace your carpet, okay? When you put in new carpet, let's assume for the moment it is quite clean, that it does not have um, uh, phthalates in it, it doesn't have flame retardants, it doesn't have these things we worry about in it. That means that it's at a very low chemical activity and therefore it's, at a, it's a sink. But over time, it will start absorbing these chemicals and become less of a sink. What you'd see here is the, a simulate, this is a simulation because I'm a modeler in the Moki group and I have to do simulations. Um, early on, the concentration in the, in the house on average would be quite low because it's such a good sink and it has such a lot of surface area. Over time, the concentration would go up and would become less effective, but your average exposure would be lower than if it wasn't there. Now, what if you said, well, let's do something else. Let's clean it every five years in some way, and you'd actually ultimately reduce your exposure quite a bit. Now, this speaks to only one chemical, because I only simulated this compound called dibutyl phthalate, but it would work for a large classes of compounds that are um, semi-volatile. Um, but I'm also um, not considering the sustainability um, component of this. What happens when you clean this? How is it clean? That's another question. But in theory, 
services have a great potential to reduce your exposure. Textiles can work in another way. So in Denmark uh, a few years ago, my colleagues and I exposed people to phthalates. And we did this in a, I know it sounds terrible, but it wasn't so bad. It was, <laughs> so, so we did this because we wanted to understand the, the mechanisms by which we absorb chemicals from the environment through our skin. And so we essentially um, put three people at a time into this chamber, basically a room, with somewhat elevated concentration of dibutyl phthalate and another phthalate. One person's wearing clean clothing, clothing with a low chemical activity of this, these th phthalates, and two people are basically naked. And they're wearing breathing hoods, and you can see them here. Um, I made sure that I was the one wearing clothing. And then we have, we have these our other colleagues who were uh, fortunate enough to go naked. Not quite naked. And so, but what we learned from this is quite um, astonishing in the sense that the, these phthalates, they're in the air, they're, they're at concentrations that are rel could, you know, relatively high compared to what's in a home, um, but it turns out that clothing is very, very effective at protecting you from those phthalates as long as it is clean. So what you see here is, uh, oops, there's uh, actually two words that are not showing up here, but this is the person with, um, with uh, wearing clothing, and this is the excretion rate, or I should say the total excreted over time of a metabolite of that um, phthalate that has been absorbed through the skin. And so the bare skin individuals had a much, much higher uptake through their skin, and the clothed individual, me, had much less. If I, I don't show it on this figure because I was going to emphasize the effectiveness, but if you actually look at the, uh, we actually did an experiment where I had hung clothes in the chamber to allow it to come to the same activity as the room, chemical activity. Um, my exposure's way up here. So clothing's very, very important, but it can be very, very protective. So let me give you a few other examples. Let's talk not about textiles, but all other surfaces. So, Temperature is very, very important. Rich pointed it out. I think Alan pointed it out. Somebody else pointed it out. Um, there were several, several people who pointed out temperature as being really important. Well, it turns out that for semi-volatile organic compounds, um, the emission rates are very, very strongly dependent on temperature, but also the, the chemical activity at surfaces that can adsorb are very um, sensitive to temperature. And if you did the following, in, a, in buildings, if you had day-night cycles when people were present or not present, and you just changed the temperature in a clever way, you could actually reduce exposure in that building just by slight changes in the temperature. Cooler when people are there, warmer when people aren't there. I talked to Bill Banfleth about this early, earlier. Something where we have to pull the building people together to say, is this a viable and economical way to reduce exposure? Similar to that, um, Consider carbon dioxide. That's one of these things, we, it's, it's a product of us. We can't not have that source in our, huh. oh, one minute, okay. I have two. Oh, two. Oh, okay, sorry, I can't read. Um, we can't, we, we emit CO2, we can't help it. How do we deal with that? Well, think about it this way. So, let's say we have a, um, a naturally ventilated building that has people in it and um, the CO2 co uh, concentration rises during the day and then when they leave it goes down at night. If you instead paint the walls with a CO2 absorbing material that lightly adsorbs CO2, we put out a lot of CO2, we can't absorb enough CO2 to paint walls with this and have it absorb forever. But at night, if it desorbs because the chemical activity gradient has changed, then we would see a situation like this where you buffer CO2. And in fact, this is proposed in this paper in which they actually develop materials just for this purpose. I'll, to be quick, because I only have a few more minutes, um, ozone um, is one of those compounds that we can actually, instead of adsorb, we can destroy at the surfaces, either by chemical reactions with organics or by chemical reactions that basically um, uh, decompose uh, ozone. And uh, Rich Corsi's group has done a lot of work with this where they've studied materials and their longevity, which was one of Mary's questions. Can these materials do something like this effectively for a long period of time? In fact, it looks like many materials probably can. We know that the reactions with, of surfaces with ozones can go on for quite a while. Um, 
And not only that, that they can be cost effective, that the cost to install materials like clay paint, this is uh, Aaron Darling's work, um, uh, is not that much, especially if you consider that you might just be using this for people who are especially sensitive to outdoor air pollution. All right, I have 30 seconds left. <laughs> this is almost my last slide. One last um, um, example. When you change the chemical activity of some chemicals, they can, you can drive them off services, and in particular, this might be useful for remediation. Um, uh, Richard Corsi and I studied methamphetamine for a few years, actually um, funded by NIST, um, and we found that, uh, that methamphetamine is very sensitive to the amount of humidity is available, and so the, the, the activity goes up when the humidity goes up, and this will drive methamphetamine off drywall. So these are just a few ideas. As my last slide, I swear, Mary, I'm almost done. Um, there, there, there's actually many, many more examples I could give you of this kind of thing. There's things we should consider, though. You know, we consider these activity gradients. You consider that, this, that the activity that you're trying to, um, to drive down, that this is for, it could be for one chemical or for classes of chemicals, but you need to look at the, this kind of holistically. So when you try to control CO2, you also want to con consider controlling other bioeffluents that may also influence your um, indoor air quality. Um, I'm going to say one last thing because I'll just, uh, the last one is that I really think what we really need to do in these cases is field interventions. We need to go out in the field and install these things and see how they, if they really do drive down exposure as expected. And this means doing everything from measuring exposure to measuring the chemistry on the services in the field. And with that, I am done. These are a bunch of people I worked with. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so Dr. Morrison, you get a, a question too. Oh, no, you don't, you don't have to necessarily come back, as so long as your mic is working. Let's make sure everybody. Is that working? Okay. Perfect. Okay, so my question is, um, when you're looking at certain products to become sinks for some of these um, pollutants that are in the indoor environment, is there ever a concern that there might be a reaction that happens within, so let's say, the carpet or the gypsum or something, right? And residuals start to happen. Oh, sure, that's always a, a, a consideration. Um, for many of the chemicals that we're looking at, uh, that, that I've considered, they're fairly stable. You know, these flame retardants are fairly stable, unless you're in certain conditions, the phthalates are fairly stable. But yes, that's always a question. It's, you know, so, uh, Yes, of course. <laughs> okay, so maybe we should take that into consideration when we no. are looking at that as a, as a solution for. Sure, sure. I'd, I'd say the one thing we know about, of course, is ozone. When you react, uh, when ozone is being removed at services, oftentimes it does generate a new pollutant that we have to be concerned about. And so you want to have materials that don't do that. Okay. And we know that things like um, concrete and clay, these kinds of materials are good at that. Right. Yeah. Perfect. So Annette, we started about five minutes late. Are we okay to go for 10 minutes of questions or five minutes of questions? Uh, let's, let's try seven minutes of seven questions. Minutes of questions, everybody. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna open it up for questions for anyone who'd like to come up to the microphone or if you are online and would like to um, submit and have joined the webcast. I think what I understand is we'd like for you to share your name when you come up to the mic and ask your questions so we can make sure to um, address you. Thank you. Hi. Yeah, hi, Bill Bonfluff, Penn State. Uh, so, so Glenn, when, when I bought my, my new house 25 years ago, it was fully carpeted. And the first thing we did was rip out all the carpets because they had hardwood floors. Um, and that's often seen as being a way of improving air quality because Carpets are notorious particulate sinks. In fact, they used air blown through dirty carpets to determine the olfactory load from buildings. But you're saying it's a, it's a gas sink that might be useful. So how, how do we <laughs> reconcile those two points of view? Sure, I mean, the, I guess the, 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 it, the carpet has to uh, be clean to begin with, obviously, and it has to, in order for it to absorb anything. Um, but you're right, I mean, over time, it's going to accumulate uh, detritus debris that does uh, have its own, um, you know, the microbial activity generating uh, VOCs. And so it's not a panacea. 
Um, yeah. So the, the question is how, how can this work in, the, in a real environment in the best way? And maybe it isn't carpet, maybe it's ceiling tiles. You know, sure. It, yeah, you know, yeah. you're just giving examples. In, in, in yeah. a similar vein, where do I have to store my clothes so that when I put them on clean, they're not already contaminated? Oh, <laughs> yes, there's an easy answer, outside. Outside. That was, that was <laughs> gonna be my solution. <laughs> okay, so we have a question uh, through Twitter. Um, this question is for Dr. Shariewa. How long do the crusts last? Do the surface crust regenerate, as Dr. Corsi mentioned this morning? How do you, how long what? The crust. On crust. The crust last. Surface crust. Yes. Oh. So, so oh, for, for this, uh, I think this person is talking about this uh, film, in indoor films. Okay. Surface crust formation. Okay. Um, they haven't mentioned that. Yes. Okay, but yeah, yeah, one, yeah, once it's generated, as long as you don't clean it, it should be there for a long time. For a long time. Yeah. Okay. Um, they haven't added any further clarification, so we're going to leave it at that unless they want to write in again. <laughs> can, can I just jump in? I think that they were asking about regeneration and that the crust doesn't prevent the uh, in, com completely the the uh, uh, the ozone from penetrating. Yes. It, o ozone it, can it just still slows penetrate. it down. Yes, it slows okay. down. Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, just a comment or question on uh, Cora's presentation. Um, you talked about the, the stoves and how the electric stove did not give off emissions. Um, and, you know, of course, since most electricity is generated through fossil fuels, you're changing the place where the combustion happens. So did you take into account, you know, the shift in indoor, the shift in air pollution? Sure, I guess it just depends on where well, and not all, in, in, Can in Ontario, we, can, we call uh, electricity hydro, like that's, you pay your hydro bill. Yeah, so um, not all electricity is generated by combustion, first of all, um, but yes, that is a concern. Um, having point sources versus many non-point sources is, is something to think about, but it really depends on where, uh, where you're most concerned about the emissions and where it's easiest to remediate them. Okay, do we have any other questions? Yes. Oh, yes. Perfect, um, thanks, Annette. So, uh, I have a question for Dr. Morrison. This is Annette Olson, AAAS. And, um, and actually, maybe also for Dr. Corsi. Um, you talked about the meth labs, uh, not meth labs, but the houses <laughs> that were <laughs> contaminated that, that with was, Yeah, that was, it was in the right direction, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, how did that work start, get involved? Were there people who called y'all, I'm from Texas, sorry, called y'all up to uh, say, we have this question, or, and what is the role in this potentially for forensics? Sure. Um, we actually were contacted uh, originally by NIST, um, who, wanted, who uh, were interested in this work and wanted to support some, some chemistry studies on, the, in, on methamphetamine. And we, uh, I don't recall more than that, other than that it was that interest, and we defined the research questions that we thought were most important in this, in which was, um, what is the form of uh, methamphetamine? How is it remediated? How does it transport through building materials? Dustin Poppendick was very involved in that work. And, um, and so uh, in terms of um, building you know, forensics, uh, I, certainly if you're considering, uh, forensics generally applies to law enforcement. And that means that if you're looking for the, uh, whether methamphetamine is available, then you could, you know, some of the work we've done actually speaks to that. Um, what we did learn in that realm was that you, you could often have very clean surfaces, which is their, their standard, right? generally the standard, you look for the amount of surface contamination, but, and not find anything, but still have a contaminated building because the methamphetamine penetrates beyond the surface into the building materials, uh, into the drywall behind. Um, so in terms of your specific question, um, it's relevant because forensics don't always catch the, uh, what's there and tell you, you know, whether or not the building's remediated. Okay. Okay, any other questions? All right, well that ends us right at seven minutes. It's perfect. <laughs>
thank you all for coming up and for being a part of this great talk. I really look forward to what else you do with your studies. Thank you. <laughs>